A good evening and welcome to our uh, Wednesday evening Bible study here at the chapel. Um, it's a real privilege for me to be greeting you this afternoon. Most of you here in Cayman know what's going on in terms of the latest uh, press briefing. So you are all calling the office and trying to find out when we're going to be having services and all that sort of thing. And I can't blame you because uh, it's been a long three months. Let me give you some announcements then concerning uh, what I know and what we can put in place in terms of upcoming services. We can start services based on what was announced today as of uh, the 21st, which is Sunday coming, which is Father's Day. But we ourselves, we will have only the planned Sunday evening uh, service, and that will be an outdoor event. Uh, it will be in our parking lot. One or two things. You can come and park your cars and stay in your cars, although that won't be the best experience. Or you can get out of your cars, bring 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 some lawn chairs or deck chairs with you. And then we will try to have everyone sit within some of the parking areas. Each one of those the parking, they're eight foot wide parking areas. And if, if we can, with, with space between people, um, that way... Being outdoors, you don't necessarily have to wear a mask, although you, you, you can. And we'll try to set up our sound system and so forth out there in the breezeway and uh, be able to, to, um, we'll be able to see each other, uh, worship together in a different way. It, it, it'll take us a little time to be able to get everything else set back up for services on the inside. We plan to do that, though, for the following Sunday. That's the 28th. That would be a service that's really our youth and children's Sunday. You'll be hearing from our young people. In fact, I believe some of our youth will be having, will be presenting the sermon, giving my voice a rest. Praise God for that. Uh, so uh, that, that is, that, that's, those are the plans right now. You bring, bring a lawn chair, bring a deck chair, and you can sit with your families, um, because we, the, 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 the new regulations still require us to maintain the social or the physical distancing as well as indoors wearing of masks and also uh, the physical distancing. So on the 28th, when we, when we return for our service there in, this, in the chapel, we will have, we'll have the pews set up in such a way that there will be, um, in a sense, um, what we call staggered, okay? They will be staggered so that every other pew we will, will, will be where the seating is taking place. And then, of course, uh, when, when there are pews opposite each other, those will be spaced, which means we will probably be able to accommodate uh, about uh, maybe 100 people or so, depending on fact, families. In other words, if there's only two people in the pew, we probably could seat maybe only 80 people in there. But if we have like a family of four or five or six persons, if you stay in the same house, you're part of the same family, you relate to each other every day during the week anyway, then, of course, you can sit in that pew. And we therefore encourage the families to sit there, which means we want to, we'll have to be sitting from the front to the back. Your preferred space may not be where you'll be able to sit on, on the 28th. So those are the plans. Uh, so much work to be done in order to get us ready for that. That service on the 28th will be a 10.30 service, 10.30 a.m. service only. And it'll probably we'll be trying to aiming more for one hour because we'll still be required to wear our masks and, as said, maintain this, the physical or the social distancing inside of the, 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 um, the chapel. And so just uh, bear those in mind and, and, and pass the good word on to people that this coming Sunday, the 21st, there'll be an outdoor event. If it rains, we'll just have to find some way to, <laughs> to uh, get around that. But anyway, we're praying for rain, but not, not on Sunday afternoon. We want, uh, and we want to have a great Father's Day um, service, um, you know, in the afternoon there. But a lot of what we have planned already for Father's Day will be on the broadcast on Sunday morning. We've already, we've had to record that service. We couldn't wait until Sunday morning. We have to record that service prior in order to have it uploaded so it can be live streamed to you. That's, uh, that's the way technology is. In order to get it all done, some of these things we have to do in advance in order to be able to get them to you. And I have to record them before and pretend that when I'm talking, it's Sunday. That's, that's, the, that's, the, um, that's the way it is. Um, so I remember when I was first, uh, when I was doing broadcasting on the radio, people would see me and say, but 
I thought you were on the radio. Uh, well, my voice is on the radio because I recorded what you were listening to. I'm not there physically every time you hear me. It's the same thing with technology today. But we're so thankful that we have, have uh, that God has spared us uh, and has allowed us to come to this point where we are, uh, we still, uh, I don't know if you've recognized it, when you consider the number of persons, uh, I guess it's now it must be about 200 plus persons. I didn't listen to the actual figure today, but um, I'm sure it is over 200 persons that have been identified as being COVID-19 positive. And yet, we've had only that one single death that uh, of someone who was a visitor at the very beginning. What else can we say except the grace of God? The, the, the favor of God, the, the mercy of God. That's what I would say. And so let us give thanks to God right now. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy to us. We thank you for what you've done for us, Lord. We thank you for how you spared uh, the Cayman Islands, how you've guided our leaders. Uh, it's been tough going. We understand that, but we, we, we thank you for the, the discipline that a lot of people have been practicing, Lord. And we thank you for the outcome. We thank you for where we are. And we're praying that you would guide us that uh, these steps of opening up and, and re 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 uh, reducing the restrictions, as it were, uh, all these things will not backfire in any way. But we will be able to go from, from freedom to freedom, from strength to strength, uh, especially in terms of being able to gather together and worship Father God, which is so much a part of our very fabric as a country, as a people, as of Caymanians. And so, Lord, here this evening, we pause to give you thanks for your goodness and your mercy to us. Thank you for this opportunity also to have this Bible study again. Thank you that we were able to get started tonight without any technological glitches at all. As far as I know, everything is going fine. I don't have to call anybody. Praise God. And you're good, Lord. You're good. God is good to us, isn't he? But we're going to do our study. We're looking in First Peter chapter 3. And we are now at the, the, the final verses in this chapter. First Peter chapter 3, verses 18 to 22. And this is got, uh, going to be a two-part um, study on just these verses. Because th these verses are loaded. And we're looking at the sufficiency. The sufficiency of Jesus' death. You will see that as we, as we get into the word. Um, and so next week, we'll, Lord willing, we'll, we'll have our um, live stream. Um, and by live stream, we, this is actually coming live. That's why if I'm late, I'm late. This is not recorded in advance and then broadcast after the fact. So this is going right now. If something goes wrong right now, it's going to be going wrong. You'll know it. Here we go. So let's read from First Peter chapter 3, verses 18 to 22. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves us, or saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. This is the word of God. Now, these five verses here in First Peter uh, chapter 3 are perhaps the most difficult verses to have confident clarity on. And for that reason, we will need to take our time and be careful not to, 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 not to be hasty in reaching conclusions, conclusions that may be inconsistent with the more clear teachings of Scripture. As you know, this is a solid principle of biblical exegesis, of biblical understanding, to use those passages that are the most clear in their meaning to help us understand those which are more troublesome, more nebulous. So before we attempt to dissect this section, however, 
let us be reminded of the bigger picture. Peter's instruction and encouragement to the scattered Jewish followers of Christ is clearly set in the context of suffering and the believer's response to suffering. Because these are the, the twin themes of, of his letter, we must conclude that the lived out experience, the lived out reality of the recipients of Peter's letter was that of suffering as Christians, or shall we say, suffering because they were Christians. And this is where we, today, here and now, may find it difficult to connect with, with Peter's audience and with Peter's letter. We living in, in the Western democratic countries are not, are not encountering the life experiences that take hold of our emotions and sharpen our focus as we read this letter. Not like those of our fellow believers in many countries today for, for whom persecution and suffering for their faith in Christ is an everyday reality. We need to remember that real learning that leads to real change must touch not only our cognitive or reasoning mind, but must also touch our emotions. And since we may not have that emotional connection with suffering, as some do, we might find it more difficult to, to, to really connect with Peter's writing. So how do you relate to this letter? Are you finding it a step too far to reach from your personal experience to what is being described in this letter? It's not that, that you and I are, are either immune to suffering or unable to empathize with those who suffer. Rather, it is that, that most of us have a, a limited repository of life references with which to identify as fellow sufferers. Certainly, most of us are not being persecuted for our faith in Christ. Now, this does not mean that we can't and won't find edification in this passage. I think we will. But first, let, let us be clear about what Peter is focusing on. So let's define what Peter means by suffering in verse 18. Because it's very, it's, it has a very specific meaning here. It reads, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. So what is clear from this verse is that when Peter speaks of Christ also suffering once for sins, he's referring to the, to the death of Christ, death of Jesus on the cross. This is why some versions of, of, of this verse will actually substitute the word death for suffering. But it's also the case that some manuscripts, some actual manuscripts of 1 Peter have the word died instead of suffered. In either case, it's clear from the context that suffered once for sins is a pointed reference to Christ's death on Calvary. We therefore understand suffered as an idiom that communicates the idea of Jesus' death. Now this understanding is reinforced again from the context by the phrase being put to death in the flesh. So when he's talking about the suffering of Jesus here, he's talking about Christ's death on the cross. Let's see just how rich and edifying this passage is. In particular, just look at, at how theologically rich verse 18 is. In that single verse, we are reminded of the, the unique nature and the purpose of Jesus' death. Peter identifies four important ways in which we have benefited from the death of Jesus. First, his death was a propitiationary sacrifice. Now, uh, that's a big word, okay? Propitiation, propitia propitiationary uh, sacrifice. His death was a propitiationary sacrifice. That means that Jesus died for, on be, or because of, or on account of the sins of others, in order that the justified punishment due us would be removed. Another way of understanding it is that, that Jesus satisfied the righteous justice of God against sin. As John writes in John chapter 2, verse 2, 
He, Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Romans chapter 3, verses 24 and 25, there Paul explains, and are talking about us, and we are, are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. As Paul writes here, God has passed over former sins because Christ took the punishment for those sins in himself. So in the words of, of Peter here in verse 18, Christ also suffered once for sins. He suffered once for sins. His death was a propitiationary sacrifice. That's the first important theological concept we find in that verse. Moving then, we find the second thing. His death was an act of substitutionary atonement. His death was an act of substitutionary atonement. We find that in the phrase, the righteous for the unrighteous. He, he died, the righteous one died, Christ died for the unrighteous, that's us. This concept is easier to grasp, I suppose, and the word easier to pronounce than propitiation. There, I, I can't even get it myself sometimes. Propitiation is tough enough, but propitiate, propitiationary is even tougher. It means that, that when Jesus died, we talk about the substitutionary atonement of Jesus' death. It means that when Jesus died, he died on behalf of and in the place of guilty sinners. It's us. Remember that scripture teaches that God will not, and God indeed, God cannot overlook sin. Sin must be paid for. And Christ in love paid for my sin and your sin by his single death on the cross. His death was an act of substitutionary atonement. That's the second important theological truth we find concerning the benefits of Christ's death for us. Thirdly, the third important theological truth that Peter includes in verse 18 is that Jesus' death was reconciliatory. You understand reconciled, so that's an easier word, reconciliatory. As Romans chapter 5 verse 10 states, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Now the phrase pointing to that fact that, uh, that Jesus' death was reconciliatory is here in First Peter chapter 3, is found in, in verse 18 in these, phrase, these words, that he might bring us to God, that he might bring us to God. What is important about this particular theological truth is that it opens to us an insight that is not found in either of the two other previous points, we said that, that his death was propitiationary and substitutionary. But in a sense, these have more of a legal or a forensic implications. They don't deal with the actual matter of our relationship with God. It's like going to court and, and being declared uh, uh, free or somebody else coming in and, and paying your fine for you. Substitution. But, but God, being reconciled to God, however, reminds us that God has taken, that God has taken the initiative to restore us to friendly relations with him because of his desire to be in fellowship with us. In fact, because of his love for us. I think, I think it is, is, a, is it is a wonderful that in just uh, one brief verse, uh, Peter has drawn our attention to three powerful truths about the death of Christ. Of course, of course, there's more. There is a subtle truth that is also here found in the word once at the beginning of that verse. This is the fourth way in which we understand the benefits of Christ's death for us. This speaks of the sufficiency of Jesus' death. Perhaps the idea is best stated in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, where, it's, where the writer of Hebrews says, We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The idea 
of sufficiency is found not only in the word once, which points to the fact that his death satisfied God's will and provided us with complete sanctification, but also in the words for all. Obviously, for all is referring to the persons for whom Christ offered his body up to death. I find it noteworthy, I just want to point this out, that, that many commentators say little about these three words, or even about this particular last two words, about these last two words for all. And possibly, perhaps it does not sit well with, with the notion which some theologians and particular school of theology, some persons have that Jesus did not die for all. That's a, that's a teaching but that he died only for a limited number of elect persons. But these three words here in Hebrews, once for all, found also here in, in Peter, speaking of the sufficiency of Christ's death, are fully in agreement with what we read elsewhere. We find it in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. We, we mentioned that already, that he, Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins. But it, John doesn't stop there. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Praise God. The death of Jesus was, uh, shall we say, exhaustively sufficient. The death of Jesus was exhaustively sufficient. And so in considering such wonderful truths as outlined just now, I feel um, as if we are shared in a, in a theological feast. And should, by this point, you know, you could do what we sometimes do when we go out to eat, when we used to go out to eat, I should say, should decline the dessert and recline somewhere and, and meditate on the goodness and the love of God towards us, as demonstrated by Jesus on the cross. It's been so rich. We've, we've filled up with the main course. We, we decline dessert at this point. Uh, so, you know, what we're going to do is divide the study into two parts. I still haven't finished what I'm saying this evening, but I want to, so we, we, we'll divide the study into two parts. But as we conclude part one of this study, let us look up just, just a little bit uh, longer, a little deeper into these verses before we push back, in a sense, from the table. Huh? Let us be reminded that, that this pointed reference to the suffering and death of Christ has been put forward by Peter as a means of reminding his readers that their suffering for the cause of Christ places them in the company of their Savior. What Paul refers to in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, as the fellowship is suffering. Their willingness to suffer for doing good, which is one means of for them creating a curiosity or inquiry from those who observe them, but may not only elicit a question from those observers regarding the reason for the hope that they have within them, but will also strengthen the believer's sense of oneness, their identity with Christ. Whatever kind of suffering we go through as Christians, we do not suffer alone. That is such a powerful and profound and important reminder. We do not suffer alone. We do not suffer in the eyes of an unsympathetic God, an unsympathetic Savior. Not only does he know our frame and understand that we are dust, but he himself is acquainted with grief. That's what Isaiah says about Jesus. He's acquainted with grief. Indeed, as we know from the text, he's also suffered, suffered to the point of death, and is more than fully qualified to sympathize and empathize with us during our times of suffering, whatever the cause of our suffering, whether it's for our faith directly or just because we are human and we have this treasure in jars of clay, earthen vessels. Now we'll have to return to this passage and consider the final verses of this chapter later on, Lord willing, next week. But rather than leaving this study with questions and speculations and maybe some some confusion, I hope not. Let us be reminded of the rich treasures that we have mined from the opening two verses, eight, verse 18 and 19, regarding the, the precious gifts 
of God's grace that Jesus provided us at his death. In one single verse, verse 18, we have been reminded that Christ's death on our behalf was propitiationary. Propitiationary. Okay, you got us a new word for your, 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 uh, you won't be able to use it in too many conversations. In other words, he fully satisfied the justifiable anger of God against sin and saves us by his death, saves us from the wrath of God. Secondly, that his death was substitutionary. That the righteous and just Jesus died in the place of and on behalf of all of us. The unrighteous dying for the... I mean, the righteous dying for the unrighteous, the, the just dying for the unjust. Thirdly, we have been reminded that Christ's death was reconciliatory. That he has restored us to friendly relations and shall we say even close family type relations with God. And finally, those three words, once for all, reminds us of the sufficiency of his death. It was sufficient in that it dealt fully and completely with our sins and the issues that are related to our sins and their, the consequences of our sins. And not only is that, it is sufficient for all persons, for all times. This is the great news of the gospel, that Christ suffered once for all, the just for the unjust, in order to bring us, to bring us to God. Praise God for that. Father, in Jesus' name, we, we pause to give you thanks for this wonderful reality. Not just something written, but written about a truth. A truth that will never grow old. A truth that has eternal relevance. Because Christ Jesus, our Lord, my Lord and Savior, died for me once for all, taking the penalty and the punishment for my sin upon himself. I give you thanks now, O oh Lord, for all that you have done. And I pray that you would bless and, and be with our people as they continue this evening to uh, hopefully just dwell upon this text. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to conclude uh, this, this time. Uh, we've already we've prayed. I want to conclude this time together. Just but a reminder, in case you joined um, a little late, I just want a reminder that um, remind you that this coming Sunday, the twenty-first, which is Father's Day, and uh, there's a, a change in the in the in the uh, in the regulations, the COVID nineteen regulations, it gives us a lot more freedom. We will be able to start church services as from Sunday on. There's still some limitations, some restrictions. But those restrictions are not so much in terms of numbers, but they will have implication to numbers because we will still have to maintain the physical distancing as well as the wearing of masks within uh, the sanctuary. In some places, they, they don't even require, they don't even allow them to run the air conditioning. They have to run the, uh, lower the windows or whatever. And I think Kimayans have become too used to comfort, not like in the old days when, we didn't know what air conditioning was. So this coming Sunday afternoon or Sunday evening at 6.30, join us here at the church. Come into the parking lot. Park your car over on the opposite side from the sanctuary and uh, bring a, a lawn chair or a, a deck chair and park yourself in one of the parking spaces. And we'll try to get somebody there to kind of help you so you're not sitting too close together. I know you want to be close together, but at least we, we don't stay six to eight feet apart from each other. And we want to have some sort of a little service together there. Um, uh, and we pray that the Lord it will reign before and after, but not during. Amen. Oh, but also on the 28th, the last Sunday of the month, it'll be our Youth and Children's Sunday. And that will be in the sanctuary, 10.30 a.m. There will be no Sunday school. We'll be talking to you later on about what we're going to do about our children's ministry, Sunday school and so forth. Because, as you know, um, regardless of the rules, children 
find it extremely difficult to stay away from each other or stay away from other, from other human beings. So um, we've got some work to, be, to get done in order to make sure that we're ready for, for um, a reopening. And so our first service will be on, in the sanctuary, will be on Sunday the 28th. And so we look forward to you joining us this Sunday afternoon, or rather Sunday evening, 6.30, in our parking lot. And we have an outdoor service. You want to bring, um, you, know, you want to pretend it's a picnic and bring your evening supper. and <laughs> Just have a good time of worshiping the Lord together. God willing, I'll be seeing you then. And uh, with that, I'm going to be saying, until Sunday, God bless you. Bye.